Okay, we're at the top of the hour, and so I think we're going to go ahead and get started, and um, other people can join in as they're able. Uh, good afternoon, and welcome to our webinar on flipping the classroom to meet the needs of students with disabilities. We're delighted that you could join us today. This webinar is brought to you by the OSEP-funded Center on Technology and Disability. And the center is designed to increase the capacity of educators, families, and other key stakeholders to effectively implement instructional, assistive, and educational technology and enhance the educational opportunities and experiences for students with disabilities. Today, we are um, joined by Kathleen Bolton, a renowned expert in using technology to enhance teaching and learning. She is the author of Time for Learning, Top 10 Reasons Why Flipping the Classroom Can Change Education, and we are excited to have this opportunity to learn from her today. But before turning it over to Kathleen, I'd like to direct your attention to some of our web sharing features today. First, I'd like to encourage you all to please use the chat box to post questions or share your ideas as um, Kathleen is presenting the information. We will make sure that all of the questions and ideas that are shared in the chat box are discussed as we move through the presentation. And secondly, throughout the presentation, Kathleen might ask you to raise your hand or ask whether or not you agree or disagree with something that she's sharing. And in order to do this, if you look at the top toolbar in your um, web sharing platform, you'll see an icon of a person raising their hand and an upside down triangle right next to that. If you click on that triangle, you'll have the opportunity to either raise your hand or agree or disagree with the statement. And that will enable us to be able to um, you know, under, um, get your thoughts and opinions about um, information as Kathleen discusses these ideas. And so I'd like to now turn it over to Kathleen and get started with a great presentation. Welcome. Thank you very much, Anna Maria. And thank you all for joining in. Um, it's very exciting to be able to do this presentation for a group of educators who I think have uh, so much to both gain and also to share in terms of your perspectives and experiences. Um, I'm talking about flipping the classroom, but it's really all about uh, strategies for enhancing our teaching and, and learning. So the overview, just quickly, of what I'm going to be talking about, so you'll have an idea, is to um, first go quickly over what's flipped learning. And um, throughout the presentation, I'll be talking about benefits for general education, which is what my focus of my book was originally. But um, I have learned uh, that there are um, these very same benefits are particularly valuable for students with disabilities. So we'll be talking about that. And I'm going to be going through, and I think it's really appropriate. Here we are with uh, the day that's um, David Letterman's last day on TV. And um, here I am doing top 10 reasons. Um, top 10 reasons why I say flipping can change education. I didn't say it will change education because uh, I think there are a lot of things that could impact it, and we'll be talking about those. Uh, so I've got caveats uh, at the end of each of my reasons. Uh, it's not quite as flip, to, to uh, use a pun, as Dave Letterman's approach. But I think top 10 reasons is a nice framework for talking about it. And then at the end of the presentation, I have a sampling of useful resources, which I hope will be of value to you all. Um, so let's get started. Uh, this is just a little uh, shameless self-promotion. This is what my book looks like. And I do hope that you might find it of interest. It's available on Corwin Press and uh, at that link. Um, and this is a definition that I think is a really nice one. It's from an educator I met at a flipped learning conference, um, an English teacher, and um, his name is Troy Cochran, and his definition is using technology to deliver asynchronous direct instruction with the intention of freeing up class time for student-centered learning. 
And I like this definition because each of those words is really uh, critical. Um, it's about technology, which is something that is now available to us to make this possible that I don't think would have been possible five, ten years ago. Um, it's about thinking about instruction with shifting time, which is why I named my book Time for Learning, because I think the time shift is a really critical piece. Uh, we're talking about direct instruction, uh, which is a part of every educator's toolkit, uh, but it's also about class time for the really exciting part of teaching, which is the opportunities for student-centered learning. So uh, each of those words, I think, has a real critical piece in our thinking about it. It's not just um, sending videos home uh, for kids to watch and then doing homework in class. That's kind of the short bumper sticker version, but I think Troy's definition here is, is a much more um, rich definition. So who is flipping? Um, well, it's interesting to see um, the latest survey, which is the um, uh, Project Tomorrow Speak Up 2014 survey, um, was asking teachers about uh, flipping. And they found that 32% of teachers in their survey are flipping a, uh, a class using videos they found online. And another 29% are creating their own videos, not quite as many as the, uh, the ones who are using them that they found um, online. And uh, what I think is particularly interesting is this latest, that third bullet, that school leaders expect pre-service teachers to know how to set up a flipped learning classroom. So they're looking for teachers coming into the classroom who already know about flipped learning. Um, and this is interesting because there's quite a bit of growth over the last uh, couple of years in these Speak Up surveys. Uh, th just three years ago, only 23% of teachers said they used online videos, and only 19% said they were creating their own. Um, and what I think is also interesting is that 40% of administrators uh, at the high school level have said that um, they saw that flipped classrooms are having a higher impact on transforming teaching and learning in their district with positive results. That's 40%. That's a, that's a pretty high number. 38% in middle schools uh, agreed with this, and 17% in elementary schools are seeing that it's making an impact. Um, and in that same survey, only 12% of teachers and only 7% of administrators uh, reported that they'd never heard of flipped learning. So let's try a little bit about um, see who you are and your level of experience with flipping uh, using that um, uh, that icon up at the top that Anna Maria uh, pointed out. If you go there and um, pull pull down on the uh, drop down next to the icon that's a uh, person waving their hand. Um, if you uh, have flipped a lesson for your own teaching, can you go up to that and click on the uh, little green um, message that says agree? And let's see how many of you uh, indicate that you have already flipped a lesson. And it should show up there on the, um, on the sidebar. Let's see if we're seeing that. Okay. A few of you, not all of you, okay. So that's interesting. Um, and I was going to say, if you have uh, made your own lesson, created your own video lesson that you've used, can you um, raise your hand for agree? So almost the same number. Okay, well, that I think that helps us see kind of where we are with our, our group here today. Um, so what I'm going to be talking about, I hope you will respond with with questions as they come up. I may not be able to answer them right away, but we're going to be keeping track and uh, we'll be answering them as soon as we possibly can to uh, keep the conversation going. So let's go through this list. The first one that is mentioned by every teacher who talks about why they're flipping their classroom is because of the opportunity to really have more time in class to work with students. 
And um, I think this is really important because when we were talking before about direct instruction, um, you know there's always time that you're going to have in the classroom where you're going to be lecturing. Um, and that kind of um, presentation of content uh, is really the dominant form of instruction. But it doesn't have to take place now in the classroom. And that's what we're seeing now with teachers moving their direct instruction out of the group learning space and uh, into the individual learning space, frees up class time for the creative and engaging work of the students. And how many times have you thought, like this, this teacher here, you know, where do the students need me most when we're working face-to-face? -face? For practice, in our discussions, with assessment, my lecture, application, remediation. Well, there's a lot of those are all part of that whole teaching process. But really, what we're seeing with the flip teaching is this opportunity to take what's the public learning space, which is when students are together in a classroom with a teacher, and take the lecture part out of that shared time to move it into the private space where uh, a person is spending their own individual time absorbing information. And then there's a lot more of that class time, which is, again, the learning space with a group that's freed up for creative and engaging work with students. And that's what teachers find so powerful. And I think that has its roots in uh, Bloom. And I know a lot of you are probably familiar with Bloom's theory um, of the hierarchy of, um, of uh, cognitive skills with remembering and understanding uh, basics at the bottom and moving on up to application and analysis, evaluation, and creating. And teachers are saying that they have the opportunity now when they move the direct instruction out of that uh, group learning space, move that into the private space so that the higher cognitive activities of uh, creating and evaluating and analyzing, that's what can be done during the uh, class period. And teachers find it very exciting to be able to have that big chunk of really higher level cognitive skill time uh, to work with students if they've done their um, delivery of information, having been sent home in the lessons that are the homework lessons. So that individual learning takes, uh, task in that private learning space. So it corresponds to these triangles. And what's really important, I think, for us to think about with students uh, with disabilities, students with learning challenges, is it gives them as much private time as they need to absorb information. And um, you know that when a lecture is done in class, it can just breeze right over the head of some students, whether they've got learning disabilities or not. Um, they, if they miss that time in class of the lecture, then it's a real problem for them. But they may be embarrassed to say, I didn't get it. I didn't hear it. Well, with the video that's sent home, with the lesson that's sent home, it's really possible for those students to spend as much time as they'll be needing on the material. So that kind of takes us to this, this next big second reason. And it's really tied in closely to the first one. And that is, when you have that more time in the classroom, uh, it really makes it possible to do what teachers um, find the most powerful part of teaching, which is individualizing instruction. And this makes it possible for teachers to work with their students on mastery learning, on uh, making sure that each student masters the particular concept before being moved forward, uh, that each student understands the underlying principles rather than being rushed along and those who get it can go faster. Well, mastery learning is a great tool, a great teaching tool, um, but it can be very hard to coordinate, to keep track of. And this is one, where, one um, area where technology can really make a difference. Because now with learning management systems and data analysis tools, uh, it's really possible for teachers to 
have the resources they need to keep track of complicated delivery and management challenges that are inherent in mastery learning. But there's a real caveat here in that this is a skill that teachers might not necessarily have developed early on. Uh, it takes a lot of practice, a lot of um, um, professional development, uh, a lot of resources, including appropriate assessments. And uh, these are things that are really necessary for teachers to adopt mastery learning. Uh, but this, the possibility that technology provides is that you have delivery that can be asynchronous. Remember back on our first definition there. It's the asynchronous delivery of content. So it means that that, that content can be different for different students. You don't have to be giving everyone the same lecture at the same time which means that you can look at your individual students to find out the best ways to present the content for them. They may not all um, learn best through the kind of lecture that you would do for our class as a whole. So with mastery learning, there's possibilities for personalizing goals, for doing pacing differently, for adapting to the styles, and again, using the technology as a tool for these complicated management challenges. This is one of the areas where teachers are spending a lot of time sharing their information with what tools they're using. So this ties it to the third reason, which is learning theory. And I think this is really powerful because, I, uh, to me, it means that this approach to teaching and learning isn't just a fad. It's really tied to what we know about how people learn. Um, and one of the things that you know, is, I think is interesting came from a, a lecture that um, uh, Donald Clark did on um, what it's called, What's Wrong with Lectures? And he went through a list of, um, I think it might be 10 things that I've got up there, and what's wrong with lecturing in the traditional way we do it. And I think it, it helps us to stop and think about you know, why we may be having problems getting through to all students. Well, when we're lecturing, it's based on a, a set amount of time that has nothing to do with learning theory. He, he maintains that the hour classroom is based on a Babylonian hour, the base 60 number system, which I think is fascinating. It's not based on the fact that people learn something in 60 minutes. Uh, he notes that people become passive observers in a, in a lecture situation, and that uh, what we all know is that our attention drops. Um, after 10 minutes, 20 minutes, for a lot of children uh, with special needs, that um, amount of time that they can focus much, much shorter. One of the problems with lecturing is that the assumption is that students are keeping track with notes, but we often don't teach note taking. Um, and it's a real critical problem for students with disabilities. If you're at the back of the class, you may not hear what's going on. You may not see what's going on. You don't have control over what that lecture is doing, the speed. Um, it makes it so that you're farther and farther um, disabled by having to um, adapt to the kind of things that might not be at your own personal speed, style, or um, learning capability. And with a lecture, you lose it. One bite of the cherry. I love that term. If you snooze, you lose. It's gone. It's over, unless, of course, you've got perfect notes. Um, and often there's just too much information in a lecture. And then the last three points, uh, lectures are determined by a particular time, a particular location, and very often the presentation can be pretty grim, pretty boring. Well, how can this be different with flipping? It's not a cure-all, but there are a lot of reasons why these these points are really can be addressed in, in um, sending the lessons home. You can send very short lessons, and most teachers recommend that the lessons that they send home are not 45-minute lectures. There would be one minute per grade level. Teachers in the fourth grade, fifth grade, are sending five-minute videos home um, on fractions for their kids to look at and then come back and work on the fractions in class. Just a short a short little chunk, and that allows for that active learning, that the student is in charge. The student can stop and pause, doesn't have any attention fall off. The learning is 
is in uh, the control of the student. They don't get it, they can rewind. You can't rewind the lecturer. And most teachers who are doing this have taught their students a new critical skill of taking notes on video. How to, how to make sense of what you're seeing, how to keep track of it, and then framing questions that they can um, use when they get back in the classroom to ask what they didn't understand so that they know what they know and what they didn't know and can articulate that. And of course, for students with disabilities, the possibilities of increasing the sound, of zooming in, of having better lighting, of having control over the pacing are all critical values that um, don't necessarily take place in the face-to-face -face lecture. And again, with the ability to stop and rewind a lecture, a student has many bites of the cherry. If they snooze, they can go back. They don't lose. And again, the cognitive uh, value of chunking content, putting the content into small modules that a student can understand at the time and understand that bit before going on. Again, in the mastery learning model, that's really important. And then time and location are no longer dictated. Uh, a student who has mobility issues can be seeing the lecture at home. A student who is sick can be seeing it at home. Um, a student who is having uh, problems with their uh, maybe being sent home for behavior issues, they don't have to lose out because they're not there in the classroom when the lecture is happening. And a presentation can be pretty bad on these, on these videos, teachers have found, but they also have found they can watch themselves and realize it and edit themselves and see how they're doing. It's a little bit scary, but they see how they teach, and that's a really important point, which we're going to get to further on. But I think these, you know, these issues about how the style of teaching is different with the technology that we have today is something that um, is really of interest and of value. So what are we finding in terms of effectiveness with flipped classrooms? Well, the good news is that teachers are collecting a lot of data, and that classroom data is convincing them that this is a really powerful teaching tool. Um, they, some of the data I've cited here, um, Byron High School is a school that I first started studying. Um, they're a pretty, um, a pretty high quality school. They don't have uh, a, lot of, a lot of problems with their students, but there are always students who need to be learning the math and need to be learning it better. And sure enough, they found 10 to 12 percent gains and students reaching their proficiency. So they were moving the bar up for everyone. A school like Clintondale High School outside of Detroit had severe problems with um, high percentages of students that were not passing English, language, art, social studies, math. They decided that they had to try flipping because they, they were really, um, they were, all their other solutions seemed not to be making a difference. Kids were just not getting the information. And they were they found that they had 19% gains in the passing rates in both English and social studies, 13% in math, and 9%, I'm sorry, 9% gain in social studies. Uh, this was enough to convince them that they were going to make their whole school a flipped school. Uh, the teachers who were flipping were asked by all the other teachers, whoa, what are you doing you know, that's making this difference? So they started training all their teachers. And um, they also found that students, by being more engaged, were having fewer disciplinary issues. And there were much higher graduation rates. So this school is often cited as um, kind of a poster child of flipping because of the data they've collected. But the reality is that um, we don't have the long-term studies. We don't have the gold standard studies. And we hope that places like AIR and, and some places where some of you all are from will do some of those studies. Because um, what we don't know is really who flipping works for and why, under what conditions. Um, so there's a lot, of, lot more data to be collected. 
but as I say, the classroom data that teachers are collecting is um, convincing them, at least, that this is making a difference. Now, I'm not seeing any questions on here. I don't know if that's something on our screen, but I would just like to say to Anna Maria, if there are any questions that have come up now or that I should address, could you let me know? Uh, yes, no problem. We don't have any questions yet. Okay. Okay. Well, we'll just move right along here. So um, I think what most intrigued me about flipping the classroom was seeing how teachers were responding and thinking about the impacts of flipping on the teachers themselves. Because um, you know what happens in teaching is you're there on your own with the door closed typically and you don't have a chance to see how other teachers teach. You don't have those opportunities to go down the hall and be in their classrooms. And I think particularly uh, with special education, uh, teachers seeing how, um, how the mainstream classes are working, seeing what's being taught, having the opportunities to be with other teachers is a real need that we just haven't figured out the best ways to address. Well, one of the things that happens with the lesson sent home flipping is that it can really open up what um, some people call the black box of teaching. It gives you an opportunity to really learn from each other by watching the videos or working together on creating the lessons. And uh, the colleagues at Byron High School that I studied uh, they developed an entire flipped math curriculum um, at the high school level. And they found, oops, they found, thank you, um, they found that their, their teachers were using their professional learning communities for developing these lessons, and they were learning so much from each other because they could see how one teacher was dealing with um, quadratic equations and watch the, watch the way the lessons were being done. Um, they could also look at their own lessons and see you know, what looked like it was working and what wasn't. And sharing their videos, sharing their results, their data in the classroom became an incredibly powerful tool for teacher lear learning and sharing. And um, what has been really powerful has been the social networks of teachers who are flipping their lessons and how much sharing is going on as they build expertise uh, across schools. In the, in the context of teachers uh, who work with special needs students, I think the opportunities to, um, to develop lessons with the mainstream teachers, with, the, um, with other special needs teachers, is a really powerful chance to see really what works, edit out what doesn't, try it again, but again, it makes that kind of teaching visible in a way that we haven't been able to do before. And um, teachers are, are reporting that this is what really is so exciting to them because they start to see their teaching in a much more open and visible way. Well, it, it wouldn't make sense, <coughs> excuse me, to do flipped classrooms if students didn't think it was a a really cool thing. And uh, this is the one thing that teachers who are surveying their students find is that the students really like the flipped classrooms. And when you think about it, it makes a lot of sense because these are kids who are born with technology. Um, they expect to be using technology. And you know, typically, if we make them park their mobile devices at home before they come into the classroom, it makes school seem less relevant. It makes it really seem like they, um, you know, they're not doing what is what they do in the real world. So they really like having the opportunity to use their tools. Um, they're communicating with technology. They're finding information with technology. They're creating with technology, and they're primed for using it in the classroom. Um, and they really seem to be responding to the self-pacing, the independence they have, um, and particularly those who need more time to grasp new concepts, like the idea that no one has to know 
how many times they watch a video. No one has to see them um, when they are when they are struggling. They can be actually listening to something and then working with their teacher privately back in the classroom on the homework. And they really like the idea that, as they say, they can rewind the teacher. And when there um, is more time in class, um, because the lessons have been sent home, there's a lot more engagement, which is a lot more interesting because students like the hands-on activity. Um, one teacher reported that before she slipped, she realized that she was spending 90% of her class time in delivering content lecturing in some form or another, and 10% of her time on hands-on activities. And then once she started sending her lessons home in the, the flipped lessons, she realized that it was this whole concept was flipped. She was spending in the classroom 90% of her time on hands-on activities, and really only about 10% of classroom time with the direct instruction. So students respond to this. Students find this really powerful. And most of them like having one-to-one -one time with teachers. Not all, though. You know, they can't hide in the background. Uh, there's much more activity going on in the classroom. Um, it can be noisy. It can be chaotic. Not all students respond to that. But um, in general, this is something that you know, students seem to find really powerful. And they don't have to miss the lesson. I mean, this is really how flipping started with um, Aaron Sams and Jonathan Bergman in Colorado. They were physics teachers and uh, chemistry teachers, and they found that their, their high school students were missing so many of their classes because they were having to, um, to leave early for uh, athletic events uh, in their rural community. And they would have to come back in and figure out how they taught how to get the lessons. So Aaron and um, Jonathan started putting their lessons on video, just their PowerPoints, and they um, discovered that their students were not only watching them, but the students who didn't miss the class were saying, would it be possible for me to look at that video? And they realized, wow, you know, for students asking if they could see more lecture, that was pretty powerful. So the idea that you know there are you don't have to worry about missing lessons on snow days, uh, when people are out sick, when there are doctor's appointments, when there are all the different kinds of um, interruptions in the class day, that those lessons can still be um, still be sent. Now of course it still means that when kids are gone, they're going to miss the hands-on activity. They're going to miss all that all that, uh, maybe it's the lab work, maybe it's the discussion. So it's not a, a cure-all, but it does mean that they don't have to be behind in terms of the content and the information. As this one student uh, at Byron said, I like being able to rewind the lessons and pause them. It gave me more time to think about things and work through them without being rushed. I like the fact that I can rewatch them if I have questions. And I like being able to do my homework in class because then I can ask questions as I go along. It also takes less time when I have help right away instead of struggling through it on my own. I think that's a pretty, a pretty powerful uh, message of, of a student's view. Which leads us to what parents think. Uh, that's my number seven in the top ten. Uh, for parents, this can be a whole interesting new window into their students' classrooms. How many times have you um, said to your kids when they come home, what did you do in school today? I don't know. What did you learn? I don't know. Well, if the parent happens to watch the video with their student, they can see what's being taught. They can appreciate what is what is perhaps the common core. They can see what those uh, concepts are about that might be a different way than they were taught when they were in school. Uh, so for, for parents, the idea of watching lessons with their children or students um, really is a, is a whole new opportunity. 
Now, many students might not need this, but younger students, it's really recommended that the parents watch the lessons with them. Um, and then parents are invited to provide feedback to the teachers. Now, this, again, can be uh, a little bit of a challenge for some teachers. Um, one math teacher told me that she was getting a lot of feedback from a, um, a parent who was a professional mathematician, but she found out that he really liked the way she was teaching, and it was a nice, uh, a nice pat on the back for her. Uh, but you're, again, the teaching becomes visible. It becomes visible for parents. It becomes visible for them to understand what the concepts are that their students are becoming responsible for. And what's really nice is that when they do the homework, the assignments, the, uh, the, um, the uh, reinforcing activities in the classroom, that means that the parents don't have to sit and do the homework with the students. Uh, if they didn't remember geometry, it's OK. It's the expert, the teacher, who can work with the student if the student has problems. And the, and the teacher can work with that student during the class time. So all these reasons tend to kind of blend together, which I think is what, what makes it interesting. Well, what about the technology? I think one of the things that makes this powerful now is that there is technology in schools. And schools have made huge investments in technology, um, as have individuals and parents. But the, um, the reality is that many students have this technology, and they can bring the technology into the classroom. Many schools are using the BYO, bring your own device approach, and letting their students bring in their machines. Uh, that same national survey, the Speak Up survey 2014, found that 28% of high school students say that they use their own mobile, mobile devices for learning in school. And 47% of teachers say their students have regular access to mobile devices in their classroom. Well, those numbers are pretty good. But there is a question about that. You know, what about those who don't have the technology? Because in fact, one in three households still don't, do not subscribe to broadband, even though seven in 10 teachers assign homework that requires their students to have access to the internet. So it calls for creative solutions on teachers' part. And uh, the first thing that all teachers say they should do, if they're going to be flipping, is do a survey of the parents uh, to ask what technologies they have in the home, what technologies they will make available to their students, what their personal um, needs are in terms of those technologies, because it may be that there's just one computer at home and all the family has to share it. So teachers need to know what the technology is available to the students, and then they create workarounds. Um, they do uh, a variety of things uh, where they can, you know, send the material home on CDs, have the kids work in the library or classroom, send home uh, laptops. But it's, unless you're going to have equal access for the students, it's not going to be uh, an approach that's going to be working. I see a question from Anna Maria, which is um, captioning of videos is required but also expensive. What approach do you recommend educators use to caption their videos? I, you know, that's a technological issue that I'm not that familiar with, but it's one of the kinds of things that the teachers on the social networks um, have conversations about on a regular basis. And um, I'm going to direct you to some of those social networks at the end for um, resources that that uh, teachers might recommend for captioning videos. Uh, I'm sure there are tools. I'm not, I'm not an expert on what, what they are. But what, I, what we are finding is that there's a, you know, a variety of resources now, many of which are um, at low cost or free. Uh, but whether captioning falls into that, I'm not that familiar. But again, there are multiple resources and technological support in schools now 
that was not the case 10, five years ago. And uh, I think what's also happening is that um, teachers and their technology specialists are working closely together to answer some of these questions. Uh, Tiffany wanted to know, for students not in the classroom on the day of labs or direct instruction, would it be good to send home for these students to try at home? Um, that's an interesting question. Um, sometimes teachers do video their lab activities um, and show that because, in fact, uh, there are a lot of things that might might pass a student by. The student might not see in, in a lab. Maybe their little lab group missed a point or uh, maybe they were too far back. So yeah, I think that's a really, um, a, a number of teachers are videoing their labs for some kind of uh, class instruction activity that uh, students can then look at as their follow-up work or as a preview to the, uh, to the lab work, perhaps. Uh, so they get an idea ahead of time. I mean, teachers are incredibly flexible with this and incredibly creative, which, which is what I find, you know, so um, exciting about this is how teachers look at their own personal instruction and say, "How can I be sure my students are understanding this better? What can I do differently? How can I stretch the instructional time?" And that's why they think about, okay, maybe I could. Maybe I could take a video of this lab as we do it and have the students watch it afterwards and analyze it again as homework. That would be powerful. So I'm just about at number nine here, as Dave would say. Uh, his things get silly at the end. Mine are not silly, I'm afraid. 21st century skills. I just wanted to put that in because you know, here we are in 2015, and we're still talking about 21st century skills. But in fact, you know, it's really important for students to be able to be comfortable using technology in ways that is the way technology is used in the real world. That happens in the flipped classroom. It's important for them to be collaborating for figuring out how to evaluate information and basically take charge of their own learning. And these are things that um, really, you know, they used to be called 21st century skills. They're just um, core learning skills, but they become a more uh, natural part of what's going on in the classroom today. So um, we wanted to put that in. And is flipping the future of education? Well, I kind of leave that up to you because you all are the educators. You are. Uh, finding what works best in your schools, in your classrooms. Uh, but I think based on the growth of the teachers using technologies for instruction, I think based on the excitement that we're seeing around this time shifting, which happens at all levels of education now, I think based on the fact that technologies are more powerful and are more available, and I think based on the fact that teachers are really getting excited about working with each other around this kind of new concept, this can be really a powerful um, track for education, if you will. I think 10 years from now, it will really look very normal. It will really seem to be just a natural way of thinking about how the school day is extended. Um, but Perhaps not. And maybe we could have a little vote here. Um, going back to our raising the hand up here on the um, icon, how many of you think that flipping will be um, a much more um, mainstream part of education in the future? If you agree, our numbers are about what they were. Yep, they're moving up. It's hard, you know, the, the, I think what happens with technology is it seems far out there, and then we try it, and then we get support, and then we get frustrated, and then we get more support, and then it becomes, again, kind of the way, the way we live. I mean, I remember being at a meeting a couple, five, ten years ago when they said, how many people have 
smartphones and there was a scattering of hands. Now you'd be in a meeting and you know everybody's looking at their smartphones, much less use, you know having them. So I think you know it's you all are folks who are thinking about uses of technology in powerful ways. Um, and I think in terms of working with students with disabilities, technologies have always been a powerful um, tool. And I think you know the technologies that make it possible to do flipped lessons, flipped teaching um, with students are very much the same technologies that are in mainstream education. They're not specialized for, for uh, special learners. So that's another reason why I think they'll be more available for teachers to use them. So that's where I put my vote. My, I would say that my, um, my vote would be yes. This is going to be something we see as more of a mainstream part of education in the future. And I can see if there are any more questions here. I'm happy to take them. Jackie Cash. Hello, Jackie. When I was studying Hi, Kathleen. <laughs> back in the days of Congressional Office of Technology Assessment, did I imagine we'd be at this point, 2015? No. Um, you know, it's interesting because this was uh, Jackie and I go way back uh, <laughs> for many, many years. And what she's referring to is I did studies for Congress back in the early 90s on the future of um, computers in education and the opportunities of the World Wide Web, as we called it then, for education. Um, but most of what we were talking about at that point was how you use technology during the class time. And I think what's interesting with flipping is that now this whole idea of instructional time is more porous. Um, that um, you know, we think differently about how how our time to learn is not just set by the the nine to three classroom hours. Um, it doesn't necessarily mean that you know students have more time at home doing homework. Although I think that can be an issue if every teacher has flipped lessons that students are watching. But I think what is different is that teachers are finding the opportunities to use their class time um, differently because they can send that home. So did I realize we'd be at this point? I don't think so. I don't think I had the foresight to understand where the technology would be taking us. Thank you. As far as um, your work with, I'm wondering if there are any any of you out there, if you want to raise your hand, if you're working with students with um, attention deficit issues, could you raise your hand up there through the uh, point there? As I'm wondering, as as a, a grandparent with a child, a uh, grandchild who's got some issues with that. Um, you know, how he could do better, because I think when he's in the classroom, he is so distracted by so much that's going on that a lot of times the class lessons just, just, you know, he's missing them. And I would love to see his teachers sending those, some of those lessons home for him to under look at with his folks on his own time without the embarrassment of having to rewind them. He can do that in private. And really having that chance to go deeper and get what he might have missed when they were, he was in a classroom full of distractions. It's just a thought that, I, you know, one of the things I've been thinking about personally, I'm wondering how, if there are any of you who have any experience with that that you wanted to share. Maybe that's not something we have anybody engaged in. Any other things you would like to share with each other? 
What I would like to do is just go, although I'm not, I don't seem to be going forward here, by the way. I wanted to go to the resources. Okay. Yeah. Um, I had mentioned that, um, you know, I'm just giving you a tip of the iceberg here. Um, there's a, an incredible uh, network of uh, educators out there who are doing this work. And um, probably the base, you know, the um, Flip Learning Network, Flip Learning Institute, the Twitter hashtag, um, Ed Webb has had a number of um, very interesting um, webinars on flipping. Um, a recent one there that I've listed is free resources for your flipped classroom. Um, you can join Ed Webb and you could join that uh, community and listen to see the, uh, the webinar. It was about a, a week or two ago. Um, but each one of these, when you go to them, you know, it's just kind of nested. The deeper you go, the more resources you're going to find. Um, among them are a link here I have, and, and this, will, this will be posted for you all, and uh, these are live links, so hopefully when you download it, you can, uh, you can access each of these. Teacher-tested tools for the flipped classroom, apps and websites, 10 best tools, uh, education technology and mobile learning. I didn't want to be listing tools and products because A, they change fast, B, some are free, some are at cost. Um, I think what's useful is though seeing what other teachers have said and going through and finding some of these that work for your particular uh, particular needs. And then, thank you. Um, there's lots of blogs, lots of interesting videos. Um, I cited a couple, three here that I found interesting. Um, Julie Shell is at uh, Harvard, and she is, uh, has a lot of very helpful information, I think, about peer instruction. Uh, it's, it's a form of mastery learning where uh, students are teaching each other, and they're moving forward um, by helping each other with concepts. It's, a pos it's a, uh, an approach that um, Eric Mazur at Harvard has been doing uh, with his students in uh, physics classes in Harvard because he found that students were not really understanding the physics concepts. Well, what he made them do is um, watch some of the lecture at home. Then he would bring in a, a, pri a, a particular problem for them to do at the beginning of class on their own. And then they would be assigned to uh, defend their solution with a couple of the students sitting around them. And then he would wander around a huge lecture hall and listen to the conversations where they were defending their physics solutions. And he was able to start to understand their misconceptions, um, the things that you know students were stumbling over. And then they were also, you know, as you have to teach others, you realize what you know and don't know and how well you know it. So he developed this whole concept of peer instruction, which Julie Schell is writing about in her blog, um, and which a lot of educators who are flipping their instruction are doing uh, as a way of having, you know, having their students learn with and from each other. Another um, learning approach is uh, Ramsey Masalam Cycles of Learning, which I think is fascinating. I recommend that to you. And then I just put down this this um, link to uh, an educator in China who um, has this video on YouTube about why she's flipping her classroom. So it's happening everywhere. It's, uh, it's, all, over, it's all around. And uh, yeah, and then I've got a, these are just um, in content areas. Tom Driscoll has a lot of really good videos, a lot of good lessons that he's happy to share. Ken Paula in world history. I mean, these folks are so creative. They've got so many wonderful resources. The folks at Byron High School, if you go to that link, it'll take you through some of their uh, mathematics work that they've been doing. And gotta go. yeah, yeah. Um, 
wanted to go back one more, I think. Two more. Yeah, high school English. Next one. Cheryl Morris and Andrew Thomason. Um, their folks, Cheryl's in um, California, Andrew is in North Carolina, and they team teach flipped classes in English. Um, and their stuff is fascinating, what they've got. Um, I recommend that. In language, um, this is a woman I feature in my book. Uh, and uh, eighth grade biology, Hassan Wilson up in New York. These are all folks that I have um, little vignettes about in my book, if you're interested, because I just think that their work is so powerful and so creative. So, yep, Ken Howell is still writing on using smartphones. Uh -huh. Absolutely. And then at the end, I think the last one that's worth concluding was uh, good old-fashioned books. Right. Uh, Troy, who I mentioned, Troy Cochran, um, uh, at the beginning of the session, uh, Flipping Your English Class, I think it's a great book. Um, and then two books by Jonathan Bergman and Aaron Sams um, are available through ISTE, Flipping Flip Learning, which is the, um, the latest one, and the, um, the original one, Flip Your Classroom. And then, of course, i got to have a plug for my book, because um, I think that this will be an opportunity to go a little deeper in what we've been talking about here today. But um, what I wanted to find was a community of special educators who are flipping the classroom. I didn't come up with that, but I'm wondering if some of you might be aware of that, or if so, if you could share that information with me, I would love to send it out and make that part of my um, my resource space uh, because I think it's such a powerful opportunity um, for those of you working with students with disabilities. Any other questions? Otherwise, I think we're getting close to our time. Yeah. I do thank you for your interest. And Kathleen, I'd like to thank you again for joining us today and um, sharing all these resources um, with everybody that's on the call. It was really wonderful to um, listen to your presentation and um, and see. I, I can't wait to actually dive down into more of these resources. I'd like to direct everyone's attention also to um, the PowerPoint is available. You can see it in the web sharing platform if you click. It says files, and if you click on the link right there, you can then download the file right out of the web sharing platform. And of course, it will be also in the um, CTD resource library if, um, if you don't download it immediately and, and want to come back and dig into these resources that Kathleen has shared with us today. And um, just as a last housekeeping, um, piece, we would appreciate it if you could click on the link to take the survey of the event. It helps us to be able to continue to improve our, um, you know, the, the process and, and the logistics surrounding the events, and also it helps us to be able to know uh, future topics and how to target the events to make sure that we're meeting the needs of all of our users. And follow us on Twitter, check us out. Um, and in YouTube and subscribe for our uh, newsletter and get some email updates from us. Thank you, Kathleen. Thank you. My pleasure.